I want to welcome everybody this evening. My name is Pastor Jeff Duncan. I'm the Director of Mission and Ministry at Lutherans for Life. And um, you have joined us in our For Life Live presentation tonight. We're going to hear from our Executive Director, uh, Reverend Michael Salomon. Uh, and I'll tell you just a little bit about that in uh, just a bit. Uh, I will put in our chat box uh, a link for an archive. Um, most of the time we get a question, hey, how about some of these old presentations that we've done, the, the past ones, can they be pulled back up again? And yes, they can. We have a For Life Live archive on our Lutherans for Life page. You can search for it, just For Life Live archive, or you can copy the uh, link that I'll put in the chat. Uh, also, I want to let you know that we will have continuing future events, the first and third Tuesdays of each month. The next session will be July 20th, the third Tuesday in July. And we're going to have Kay Meyer, the president and um, um, founder of Family Shield Ministries in St. Louis. She's uh, working on a presentation called Prayer Warriors for Christ and Life. Family Shield Ministries um, is, is an organization that cares about families growing in Christ and equips, um, like Lutherans for Life does, uh, to be witnesses to each other and to the world. Um, and her program summary is uh, a little uh, unique. Um, I, I talked to uh, um, Kay about this, and she is going to share uh, some stories from five young women who have chose life for their children and help us learn how we can be prayer warriors for Christ and life. Um, she's going to ask questions like, what motivates teenagers and young women to choose life for their unborn babies? What challenges do women face that release their babies for adoption or those who raise their children on their own? How can we help them come to know Christ and grow in faith? And how can we be a, a prayer warrior for Christ and life? Kay's a, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, uh, not only the founder and president of Family Shield Ministries, but she is also a host of their radio program that's heard on more than 50 radio stations across the United States, as well as a weekly podcast. She has 40 years of evangelism, spiritual growth, family ministry, and pro-life experience, written numerous books, hundreds of Bible studies, devotions, and articles, and um, she's going to share some of that history, and encourage us to become those prayer warriors for Christ and life. So that will be on July 20th. As we prepare for tonight, I was thinking um, about the times that I've stood on the steps of the Supreme Court of the United States uh, following a March for Life past our Capitol. It was there that I listened to the stories of women and sometimes men who have participated in past abortion decisions. They were heartfelt stories, told through tears, cracked voices, and they tugged on your emotions as you heard and listened. At the end, you just wanted to hug, embrace, and comfort them through all of their recalled grief that they shared. Thankfully, these stories most often conclude with the gospel of forgiveness and restoration in Christ Jesus. His redeeming death upon the cross for all sinners, works the faith to trust and believe that this Son of God died for them to forgive their sins, to heal them, and provide an opportunity to rebuild their lives shattered from the um, participation of, a, a, of an abortion. Yet not all the are happy endings on those Supreme Court steps. There are often a handful, if not more, of both women and men shouting down those voices of hope and championing their own voice of death in abortion advocacy. How do you speak to their concerns? What do you say to their challenges that some life, at least the life in the womb, should not be protected? Some life doesn't deserve rights. Some life may not even be life at all. Some desires and wants trump all other considerations, and who are you anyway to try and tell me what is right and what is wrong? And you don't even need to go to Washington, D.C. or the Supreme Court steps to encounter these conversations. If you listen, they're right there in your pew. It's right there in your neighborhood. Women and men 
young and old, even in your own congregations, looking for answers to deep questions and concerns they have about the morality of abortion and the healing application of Christ's death and resurrection for sinners, sinners of which chiefly I am among all. Tonight, Reverend Solomon is going to lead us in a portion of a discussion for our benefit and for the advancement of the gospel of forgiveness and love to those who most definitely need to hear from us in sensitive, eloquent, and winsome ways that all life matters and that there is forgiveness in Christ our Lord. So let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So Pastor Solomon's presentation tonight is called Speaking the Truth in Love, Engaging Abortion Advocates, Arguments and Objections. And he's going to go through uh, a series of statements uh, as, a, as a portion of his presentation, and, and then look into how we can share God's grace sensitively, eloquently, and winsomely in response to these and other invitations. Well, Pastor Solomon has been the director of Lutherans for Life uh, since January of 2016, he uh, won the position of director-elect in August of 2015. Um, he followed uh, the, in this position from his years in churches. Uh, he was the associate pastor of St. James Lutheran Church and School in Lafayette, Indiana, 2005 to 2015. And prior to that, uh, served as pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Webster, Minnesota, 2003. 2005. He did receive his Master of Divinity in 2003 from Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, and prior to that, uh, a BA in Theology from Concordia University, Chicago, River Forest, 1999, and then um, now uh, is um, living in St. Louis with his wife, Heather, and uh, I guess Pastor only two children now, since you're sending one to school, is that right? You've got Christian, Nathan, and Luke, and you guys go to Emmanuel Lutheran Church and all of that. Who, who's still residing with you there? All of us. Christian goes to uh, college in the fall. Oh, okay. So he's still with you for the time being, but you're getting ready to, to send him off. And Indeed. Welcome him to the next phase of his life. So uh, please welcome Reverend Solomon, and uh, we look forward to your presentation tonight, sir. All right, I'm going to try the share screen here. There we go. I'm getting better at this, I think. That only took a moment. <clears throat> but uh, speaking the truth in love about abortion, how we're going to proceed tonight is uh, we're going to go through a series of eight myths uh, about conversations related to the sanctity of life. <clears throat> so uh, myth number one, before we even get started having a conversation about the sanctity of life, a lot of us uh, and a lot of the people around us don't even want to engage in that kind of conversation because we believe, they believe, abortion debates and pro-life advocates proceed in anxiety and anger. We, of course, counter that with the truth that Lutherans for Life equips Lutherans to be gospel-motivated voices for life. That's sort of the hallmark of our ministry and our community. So before we can undertake the why and what and how of speaking the truth in love, we must understand to whom are we speaking. Speaking the truth in love about abortion begins not with the person that you're talking to. It begins with you. It begins with me. And you and me, we are beset by sinfulness. So before we even start to engage in a conversation where we address objections or answer questions about the sanctity of life, we have to remember that you and me, sadly, we are as guilty as anyone else of hate toward our neighbors. 
Sometimes we have hatred in our hearts toward that neighbor that's right in front of us. Our aggressiveness, our indifference, our criticisms and our complaints, our attitudes, or even just our intentions have treated the people around us as if they were inconveniences. And that's exactly what's wrong with abortion. It treats another human being like an inconvenience. We have done that. So we must confront our anxieties and confess our idols before we even engage in conversation. Why do we want to speak the truth about abortion? Am I trying to become popular? Do I want to say something that somebody else is going to like? Am I hoping that I will end up being comfortable, that if I say the right thing, it'll make my anxiety or someone else's anxiety go away? Am I trying to prove that I am superior to the person in front of me or show that I can be their savior, that I can save them from some difficulty they are facing or that they might face? The problem is, my friends, sometimes we use people to meet our own needs. And that's not serving and that's not speaking the truth in love. That's the difficult truth. And here's the good news. Even so, you are beloved by Almighty God. We have been forgiven already of our failure. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be perfect. Even in those conversations about the sanctity of life, you don't have to prove that you are the expert. You don't have to show how successful you are. God has already enlisted you. God has already positioned you to be his instrument. And you know what that means? That means that even in those difficult conversations, God retains responsibility for all the results. If somebody receives our word of truth, God gets the credit. If somebody rejects our word of truth, that also is in God's hands we may remain calm. We may remain cheerful. We may have confidence. We may have conviction. Take comfort. Take courage. Because you know this to be true. The word of the Lord will take root and bear its fruit in his time and according to his will. Remember also that the person with whom you are engaging, they bear the image of God. Life issues are not contests. They are not competitions. We're not just talking about personal prerogatives or political controversies. We're not just dealing with difficult conversations or differences of opinion. Remember that life issues are people. It's always about people. And that one right in front of you, even if that person is annoying, even if that person is smelly or looks like a truck or doesn't believe in God, that person is special. They're precious. They're priceless to the same Heavenly Father as us. He is the one who creates and redeems and calls them to be his precious treasures forever. And that's what we want to communicate above all, because it is that gospel that changes hearts that saves lives. That person is a gift to you, is a gift to me, no matter what they promote or participate in. So our goal is not to be right. Oh, I know that our desire, our temptation is to want to be right, to want to shut somebody up. But that's not our motivation. Our motivation is not even to change their mind. Our mission as Lutherans for Life is not primarily to enact certain legislation or elect particular officials or overturn Roe v. Wade or even end abortion altogether. Certainly, we hope and pray that these things will happen and we support and we work together and we celebrate when those things come to pass. But our unique purpose and privilege as Lutherans for Life is to proclaim and to put into practice the grace of God for that one who is broken right in front of us. Remember, too, that if you are nervous about this engagement, this conversation, they are apprehensive as well. So we have to approach sensitively and gently and compassionately, not as if we're going into battle with that person, but as if we are reaching out to rescue them from their hurt. How do we do that? Well, we can ask permission to investigate these problems together. Is it okay if I talk to you about this? Avoid snark 
and sarcasm, especially if you're conversing on social media. It's not going to get us anywhere. We can ask them about their specific experiences with abortion circumstances. What personal experience do you have with these situations? We can invite them to share their hurts and their concerns, asking genuine questions. Remember, the goal is not to convert somebody to our point of view, but to show the compassion of Jesus Christ to them. So we can listen Listen for what complicates the topic for them as they talk about their experiences and their concerns. What, what confuses the implications for them? What other factors are at play? Their experiences, their fears. We can open a whole relationship with them, being patient, sometimes leaving the issue of the sanctity of life altogether and talking about something else, sometimes repeating ourselves if we have to, maybe revisiting it when they're ready. And we assume that they are operating out of woundedness and not out of cruelty. We assume that they don't know the truth rather than that they don't care. Because the truth is just like you and me, they are victims of sinfulness. They have been injured. They have been abandoned by people. So that is why we work very hard to identify and affirm the common grounds between us. If they express that surprise pregnancies are very difficult situations, we can sympathize with that. If they say that poverty is not good, that disability needs to be addressed, that inequalities, isolation, abuse, are bad things. We can agree with them. We can say, absolutely. We can apologize for the ways in which people claiming to be Christian have mistreated them. We can apologize for the way in which the culture has deceived or let them down. We can declare and show them with courage and compassion that the joy of the Lord is among us that there is hope in his plans and that he has an abundant and everlasting life, not just for me, but for everyone. We always want to end our interactions with something that the gospel says yes to, right? It's not enough for us as Lutherans to simply communicate how the word of God says no to killing. What does God say yes to that's better? He says yes to community. He says yes to a purpose. He says yes to hope and faith. He says yes to relationships. He says yes to life in all of its circumstances. Sometimes we might not have the answers to the questions that they're looking for, the objections that they raise. So we can be honest about that and say, hmm, that's a great question. I don't know the answer, but could we explore that together? Could we find people or places where we can investigate that and find out? And then, of course, we can celebrate with them all of the blessings of their life, their years, their experiences, highlight the good things about their family, their community, and be grateful that our Maker and Savior gives freely to everyone, even though none of us deserve it. Myth number two. Suppose we have patiently listened and compassionately engaged with the person in front of us. We have entered into an ongoing relationship with them, and we have asked questions. We have prayed and prepared ourselves. We've gotten their permission to proceed in conversation. And they say, well, the thing is, the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion. I don't understand why Christians are so obsessed with this. We need to maintain the separation of church and state and keep politics out of the pulpit. Have you ever heard this one? The truth is, the same Lord Jesus Christ, who exercises authority over spiritual matters, is also the Lord of civic affairs. God rules our world both by the gospel and by the government. And the good news is he has invited us, his people, to have a hand in both of these activities. In fact, 
the whole Bible is about how God's love gives sanctity and significance to every human life. That's the central message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are specific passages that apply personhood directly to children. We think of the very familiar Psalm 139, verse 15 and 16, for you formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. There are many other passages of scripture that emphasize the great value of children, including unborn children. We think of when the mother of our Lord carried him in her womb to visit her relative Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist, and the young John leapt for joy in his mother's womb. The Word of God also explicitly in several places prohibits the killing of children, even if those children are your own. So the Bible is kind of clear when it comes to this central issue. But more than that, Christianity as a whole has changed the world with the way that it respects and protects every human being. You remember how Jesus and his early believers paid particular attention to those persons who were marginalized, persons suffering disability, demon possession, those who were left out because of the laws and traditions of the culture around them, women, children. Before this time, before Jesus and his gospel came into the world, ancient Near Eastern civilizations commonly aborted or abandoned children. We have evidence of this from um, ancient Roman and Greek societies, from ancient um, Southeastern and Eastern Asian cultures, from ancient African or South American cultures. Only because, only because of Christian influence does our culture even care about women's rights at all. Before Jesus, women were treated almost universally as property. Also from the very beginning, there are Christian documents outside of the Bible that come right out and say, the Christian faith does not permit you to undergo abortion. There are also several references in the Bible that condemn those who were closely associated with the practice of abortion. Sometimes in your Bibles, in, for example, in Galatians chapter 5 or Revelation chapter 22, um, there are passages that talk about how uh, sorcerers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That word for sorcerer is actually the Greek word pharmacist. Strange, huh? Of course, the pharmacists of today are not engaged in anything like the pharmacists of old were. Pharmacy today is a science. Back in the time of the ancient Greeks and Romans, it was more of a religion. And the pharmacist was the one you went to when you wanted to get a contraceptive or a substance that you could swallow or place on your body to cause an abortion. And so St. Paul and St. John in those epistles come right out and say, those who are engaged in this kind of activity, those who are associated with abortion, if they continue in their practices, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, life issues like surprise pregnancies may be politically volatile. They may be emotionally charged. But we believe that upholding human worth, even in the face of failure and pain, this is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we speak about the sanctity of life, it's not something in addition to the central mission of the church of the people of God. This is what it's all about. The pressure and the deception of using death as a solution for difficulty also impacts the hearts and lives of people in church pews as much as it does anyone else. So it's not only entirely appropriate that our Christian communities speak out and speak toward each other about the sanctity of life. It is a must. It is a gift which God has given us, which we must pass along to others. Well, so far, my friends, you've been very persuasive. You've been convincing to the person in front of you that you've patiently engaged in conversation with. 
But now that person's ready to move on to myth number three. Okay, this person says, I'll take your word for it. Christianity is opposed to abortion. Whatever. The truth is, embryos and fetuses aren't even fully human beings. They are just fertilized eggs or parasites or products of conception or clumps of cells or blobs of tissue or tumors or uterine contents or any of a number of other euphemisms you have heard used to dehumanize the child before he is born. What's the truth? The truth is, hmm, what is it then? The decisive distinction in evaluating abortion is what it is. We can't answer the question, can I kill this, until we determine what is it. I mean, think of yourself standing at the kitchen sink, looking out the window into the summer evening as you patiently wash the dinner dishes, and a little one comes up behind you, and a little one says, can I kill this? And you turn around and you look, and they're holding something in their hands. Before you can give an answer, you have to ask a question. The little one says, can I kill this? And you have to say, well, what is it? Because if it's a spider, then yes, kill it. Kill it with fire. But if it's the neighbor boy, no, you cannot kill that. We got to know what it is. Someone much smarter than me has said this about unborn children and abortion. Listen carefully. This is great. If the unborn one is not a human being, then no justification for abortion is necessary. If the unborn one is not a human being, then there is no justification necessary. It's part of your body. You can do with it whatever you want. But if the unborn one is a human being, no justification for abortion is sufficient. If the unborn one is a human being, there's no reason you can come up with that will ever be good enough to justify killing that child. Do you know what the law of the United States has said about what it is? What is this unborn one in mother's womb? The law says, we don't know. Each person should decide for themselves. I say that's patently ridiculous. If you and I are driving in an automobile down the road at dusk and off in the distance about 300 yards, I see something in the middle of the road and I say, huh, that looks like a trash bag. Wouldn't it be fun if I pushed the pedal to the metal and we drove right through it and scattered trash all over the ground? And you look closely and you say, hmm, I don't know. That kind of looks like it could be a person. Maybe you should slow down and check. What's the right course of action? If we don't know whether or not this is a human being, shouldn't we err on the side of caution and say, let's not do anything to it until we figure it out? The truth is, the science is already settled. The unborn offspring is a unique individual separate from her mother. She has her own DNA, different from the body in which she resides. She keeps her own heart rate and temperature from the very earliest stages of development. She possesses her own blood type, her own sex, right? I always love it when a lady says, it's my body, my choice. And I say, hmm, does your body have four legs or four arms? Right, two of those belong to somebody else. The little one is alive, according to the scientific definition. You remember the scientific definition of alive from grade school biology. That means that she grows, she undergoes respiration, she responds to stimuli, and she metabolizes energy for herself. That's scientific. That doesn't come from the Bible. That's something we all agree on. Also, the unborn embryo, even from the very first moments of fertilization, meets all of the technical criteria for an independent organism. This is what makes the embryo different from my fingernails or my hair. Now, nobody has a problem with me cutting my fingernails or doing whatever I want to to my hair. But the unborn one is not just part of an organism, but an 
independent organism. How do we know? He does these five things, uh, four things. He does these four things. Number one, he develops toward maturity. In other words, left alone, he will grow into a different form, an adult. Number two, number two he regulates his own processes and coordinates all his functions for the well-being of the whole. That means he balances all of the different things that have to be done in the body to make sure that one of them doesn't take priority over the others. Number three, he adapts to variations in his environment. He's able to change with temperature and shape and pressure. Number four, he repairs damage to himself. Instead of just growing bigger, he replaces parts that have been removed or hurt. Also, the unborn embryo is human. He does not properly belong to any other biological classification. Of course, this is one of the basic laws of biology. Species reproduce only after their own kinds. If you are pregnant, it's a human being in there, not a rock, not a log, not a frog. Of course, we know the facts of human development from 18 days gestation, embryos have a heartbeat at eight weeks, each one has brain waves and all of the same anatomical structures as an adult. The only thing that makes the unborn child different from you or from me is his size, his level of development, his environment and his degree of dependency. Well, in no other circumstance in our world do we change a person's value based on any one of these factors. Treating each other differently because of any of these categories is discrimination. If people of different sizes have different rights, if people of different levels of development have different value, if people who come from different locations or live in different environments are treated differently, if people who differ in their degrees of dependency on one another, and we are all dependent upon one another to some degree or another, if any of those things causes us to be treated differently or unfairly, it's discrimination. And that's because we know that our worth as human beings is intrinsic. That means it is due to who we are. Our worth is not functional. That is because of what we do. So it really doesn't matter what the unborn child can do or cannot do. Their value, their identity as a human being comes because of what they're made out of. The unborn one isn't just an object or even just a human being but he is a gift, she is a privilege. They are treasures just as much as all the rest of us. And that's how we end a conversation with something God says yes to, right? God says, yes, you are valuable. And these little ones are just as valuable as you and me. You're really making progress with this person because they're ready to move on to the next bullet in the chamber and they load up the big one. Okay, I don't care about science. I don't care about the scriptures. It's my body and my choice. Abortion is a private decision between a woman and her physician. So get the government out of my morality and your laws off my lady parts. Boy, that should shut us up, huh? Here's where you need to start to listen with the ears of Jesus. The good shepherd has trained you how to hear. When somebody says, my body, my choice, what the devil has really convinced them to believe is you're on your own. The devil wants to get you on your own. He wants to isolate you and get you to, to think that nobody cares about you but you. The devil says, your body your choice, your problem, your fault. That's what he wants people to think. It's your problem. You have to fix it. And then when it all goes wrong, the devil's favorite thing to do is come and assign the blame and the shame. And he says, it's your fault. Nobody could possibly love you. It's all part of one lie. 
once we hear it that way as Christians armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can reach out with the best answer. The truth is, you're not alone. I know you think it's just your body and your choice, but you don't have to handle this on your own. You see, your body doesn't just belong to you. It belongs to the Almighty Father who made it. Your body, your life belongs to the incarnate Son of God who redeemed it by his death on the cross and his resurrection. Your body, your life, all even your choices belong to the Holy Spirit who has called you into his everlasting household. And I can assure you he is protecting and providing for your every need. The truth is, you can do this. You can endure this surprise pregnancy. You can raise this child. You can help this person out. And the body of Christ is going to surround you and support you. See, the truth is humankind is designed to be connected. So there's no such thing as a personal choice. There's no such thing as a private matter. That means abortion can't be a private matter. And that's actually the truth. Every abortion involves dozens of other people, not just a woman and her doctor. It involves a father or a husband, siblings who may come along later or who may, uh, who may exist already, grandparents, of course, the doctor and the nurses, the pharmacists and the manufacturers who put together the, the devices and the substances that make abortion possible, public officials who have to uh, make and enforce laws related to it, citizens who will be in similar situations, the guilt and the grief of any one abortion impacts all these people as well. And furthermore, we have already established that abortion involves even more directly another body, not just yours, the body of that unborn child. What about her body? What about her choice? Or let's think of it this way. What if we weren't talking about an unborn child? What if we were talking about a toddler? Now remember, the only thing that makes an unborn child different from a toddler is size, level of development, environment or location, and the degree of dependency. We've already determined that none of those is relevant to determining a person's rights or value. But let's ask the question this way. Could a mother choose to put her toddler to death if that little one became an inconvenience? I don't think anybody with half a brain would say that's okay, including the person standing right in front of you and me. So why does it make it okay to put the little baby to death? Then we're going to circle right back around to the science, which says this little one is identical in all relevant ways to the toddler. The truth is that nobody has the right to do anything that they want. If that were the world that we live in, a world with no laws, with no limitations, the result would be chaos and injustice. We limit our freedoms when they begin to infringe upon somebody else's. Freedom to choose depends on the freedom to choose what? Freedom to choose depends on the freedom to choose what? The best way that we can safeguard choice is by not robbing anybody of choice's consequences. And abortion takes away the consequences of a choice. That choice, of course, to engage in sexual intercourse, the consequence, pregnancy. Is it appropriate for the government to legislate morality? Well, the government has to ensure the safety of its most vulnerable citizens above anything else. If we were gonna start from scratch with the most limited, tiny government possible, for example, if we wanted to create a government that only made one law, which law would we choose? I'm pretty sure most of us would agree that law would be you can't kill somebody just because they're weaker than you. The government has a compelling interest in discouraging some choices. In fact, by definition, law imposes 
morality. That's the job of law, to tell us what is right or wrong. So the government has to impose morality, which is exactly what they did with Roe v. Wade in 1973. That decision made a particular religious perspective the law of the land. Do you ever think about it that way? The Supreme Court imposed their religion on everybody else. Of course, we believe their religious perspective was irrational and inconsistent and unjust. But it favored particular priorities. The surveys nowadays, the polls indicate that American majorities support abortion restrictions in most or in all cases. That includes many people who are not religious at all. But moralities are not established by majority. What is legal is not always what is right. So we believe the case against abortion rests not just on religion, but on science, on reason, and on the common good. So if we're gonna talk about my body, my choice, women's rights, perhaps we should admit most women oppose abortion. As public policy, the majority of women oppose abortion access. But attempting to disqualify men from the abortion conversation is dishonest and futile. To say no uterus, no say, makes absolutely no sense. Ethics, responsibilities, and rights don't have sexes. <laughs> or have we forgotten that Roe v. Wade was decided by nine men? Well, if the voices of men don't count, we can throw that decision right out. The fact of the matter is, every baby has to come from a father's body too, which means that abortion is a men's issue. And I have found that abortion actually encourages sexism. It makes pregnancy entirely the woman's problem, right? You don't want to have a baby? You go fix it. If you end up being a single mother, that's your fault. You could have taken care of that. That's what abortion teaches us to believe. It is demeaning to women to suggest that pregnancy is a disorder or a disease. <laughs> the scientific fact is conception occurs when a woman's body functions exactly as it's supposed to. Pregnancy is proof you're a woman. But if we wanna talk about what's really harmful, abortion inflicts a lot of harm on a woman and her body. No less than 20 to 30% of women who undergo abortion suffer serious negative medical and emotional after effects. That can include pain, hemorrhaging, reproductive system cancers, infertility, risks to future pregnancies, PTSD. Post-abortive women have a higher suicide rate than women who carry to term, or even than women who experience miscarriage. Only one in 10,000 pregnancies results in death. Four times more women die in the year after having an abortion than after giving birth. And experts in our culture have the audacity to say, abortion is safer than childbirth. Safer for whom? Last time I checked, every abortion results in a death. And women regularly die even from legal abortions. Abortion clinics are among the least regulated of all medical facilities. Abortion complications go underreported. So someone has to wonder whether abortion activists really believe abortion is health care or not. That's why God's plan, God's way for marriage, sexuality, procreation, and family will carry you through even the difficult times. Well, I think you're really getting under your counterpart's skin now because they've moved on from this objection 
to the next one. Well, the person across from you says, abortion solves all kinds of social problems, like it avoids the dangers of unwanted children or the dangers of illegal procedures. Abortion um, takes care of inequalities between women and men. It, it helps with poverty and overpopulation. Here's where I like to ask a question. What particular instances do you have in mind? How have you experienced this, that, that abortion makes situations of poverty or unwanted children better? How have you experienced that abortion makes women equal to men or that it solves overpopulation? If we were dealing with toddlers, for example, if a mom living in poverty had five toddlers, would we address the situation in the same way and say, I know the best way to get you out of poverty, just pick two of your kids to put to death. In other words, would you allow the killing of an older child or even an adult in order to lighten a social burden? Would we solve homelessness or mental illness by executing the people who suffer from it? But if it doesn't make sense in those situations, why does it make sense when it comes to unborn children? Remember, the science says these unborn children are functionally no different from everyone else. But if you really believe that abortion is the solution to social problems, would you be willing to restrict abortion access only to those circumstances? In other words, would you be willing to say abortion is only allowable for those who are experiencing documented poverty or who can show that their children are unwanted? or who can prove that they are somehow unequal to a man? Would you force people in those situations to undergo abortion? Would you abandon your support for abortion if we could find a more effective solution? Because if not, if you answer no to any of those questions, what that tells me is that you don't really believe that abortion is necessary because of social problems. You're just bringing up an emotionally difficult issue to cloud the situation. Here's what I think you and I really believe. Getting rid of a problem is not the same as getting to a solution. I mean, you're a good person. Surely you don't desire a society that exterminates people who it perceives to be obstacles. I mean, very few conscientious human beings would find comfort worth purchasing with innocent blood. Isn't it the case that the key ingredient to overcoming social problems is community? The old saying, two heads are better than one, applies when we're talking about these social problems like poverty, like unwanted children, inequality, overpopulation. More hands and more minds equals more solutions. We are better than this. We can find remedies without taking life. We are just that creative and capable. Because the truth is that none of these social difficulties like poverty or unwanted children or overpopulation or inequality, none of them has decreased since abortion was legalized. Have you asked the people who are suffering these situations what they want, what they need? Why do we assume that people in these situations don't want their children? The statistics tell us that most parents love their unborn babies and almost all unborn children are planned. Or should only rich people be allowed to have families? 
Why is it that the people who are most in favor of abortion are wealthy white folks? Is it only a coincidence that Planned Parenthood arose out of eugenics, the same ideology that made the Holocaust possible? The truth is, my friend, no child ever goes unwanted. There are more couples pursuing adoption today than will be able to complete it. The Christian community welcomes all orphans. Wantedness or a lack of wantedness, that says more about the culture than it does about the child. But for my money, it's abortion that actually makes poverty and oppression worse, that makes abuse and inequality worse for children. All right, now we're at the point. You remember those old Western movies when the gunslinger fires one, two, three, four, five, six shots, and then they got nothing left? What do they do? Throw the gun. So here we go. When you get to this point in a conversation with somebody about the sanctity of life, you know they've run out of bullets and they're just throwing the gun. And they say, sometimes pregnancy threatens the mother's health. Sometimes pregnancy is a result of sexual assault. Sometimes pregnancies involve serious deformities or disabilities. And these cases make it important, even necessary, for us to have access to abortion. But the truth is, we don't have to choose between the life of the mother and the child. When pregnancy complications put lives at risk, we can try to save both. We can try. If it proves unsuccessful, then we will grieve the loss of life and still save whomever we can. But I am told by medical experts with decades of experience in obstetrics that only very rarely does a pregnancy endanger a mother's survival. And in those cases, the medical course of action is to deliver the baby, not to kill the baby. Now, of course, we know sometimes when you remove a baby from mom's body, you know that baby has a very, very low chance of survival. But that is different than intentionally putting the baby to death. And procedures separating unborn children from their mother's body were legal even before convenience abortion. We must remember that impairment of health must be distinguished from a threat to life. It is true that pregnancy and delivery, just like motherhood in general, always causes a burden, many burdens, to the mother. Sometimes those burdens cause her health problems, physically, emotionally. But would an impairment to the mother's health justify ending the life of her older child, say a six-year-old? If mom became ill and couldn't care for herself anymore, much less her little one, would we say it's okay if we just smother that child with a pillow? Would you be willing to limit abortion access to situations where the mother's life and health are in danger? Because if not, then you don't really believe that that's the reason that abortion should be legal. Let's move on to the difficult one. And this is why it often get ra gets raised in these conversations, because it's difficult to address. Any fair and safe society has to vigorously discourage and discipline sexual assault. It is wrong. Society ought to apply severe measures to prevent sexual assault from taking place in the first place. Governments and whole communities have a duty to devote all the resources they can to finding, prosecuting, and removing sexual assault offenders. It is very important for us as advocates of the sanctity of life to be very vocal about that. Governments and communities also have a responsibility 
to apply their resources to supporting and healing the victims of sexual assault. And my question is, how does abortion help? Has anyone asked the victims of sexual assault what they need? Or do we just assume what we think we would want in their situation? Because many victims of sexual assault tell us that when they became pregnant as a result of that assault and they underwent an abortion, it only made their suffering worse. And many victims of sexual assault who became pregnant as a result of that assault and carried their children to term tell us that motherhood actually helped them recover. It gave them the opportunity to bring something good out of something bad. It gave them power over their circumstances again. A only a little more than 1% of all abortions relate to sexual assault. Would you be willing to restrict abortion only to those cases? Would you abandon support for abortion if we could find uh, better ways to deal with the situation like adoption? What if a sexual assault victim became pregnant, gave birth, and then later decided to end the child's life? Would that be okay? Because if not, then the sexual assault is not your real reason for supporting abortion. Your real reason is that you don't believe the unborn one is a human being, and we need to circle way back around to talking about the science again. What if you discovered that one of your loved ones had been conceived in sexual assault? Would the same principles apply in that case? Remember also that the child is a victim. What makes sexual assault wrong is the same thing that makes abortion wrong. It violates an innocent person's body. As individuals, as a civilization, even sexual assault does not take away our ability to overcome evil with good. And let's talk about persons with disabilities. Let's talk about pregnancies where disabilities are diagnosed. Did you know that most disabled persons and their families actually like their lives? They are grateful and appreciate their lives. Did you know that many disabilities and deformities don't turn out to be as bad as they were feared? Did you know that doctors regularly get diagnoses wrong? Disabilities actually can offer us wonderful opportunities teaching us about compassion, cooperation, giving us unique and otherwise overlooked perspectives. But research indicates that abortions that involve a disability or deformity actually increase the risks and complications of grief and guilt afterwards. Would you find it appropriate to end the life of an already born child or an adult who develops a disability? In other words, if they weren't born with it, but it came about as a result of an injury or an illness, would it be okay to put them to death? And which injuries, which emotional disorders, which behavioral stresses would qualify for execution and which ones wouldn't? Would you be willing to limit abortions only to those circumstances where disabilities were a factor? Would you abandon your support for abortion if we found other strategies that were more effective? Because if you wouldn't, say it with me, that's not your real reason for supporting abortion. When we defend, when we cherish a person's value, despite their differences, that benefits all of us. We're almost there, guys. Only two more. Now the person with whom you've been speaking is in a panic. So instead of raising objections to the arguments, this person that you're engaging with starts to raise objections to the people. And they say, well, those who oppose abortion don't have any credibility because they only care about babies before they're born. They're not in favor of expanding state welfare programs. They won't oppose other life-threatening injustices like gun violence or capital punishment or the needs of refugees. They're deceptive, they're judgmental, and they're violent. So what do you have to say to that? 
How about this? My friend, just like you, advocates of the sanctity of life also want injustices to come to an end. However, I alone can't bring an end to every injustice. Should I wait until we can make all the bad things go away before I start to try to fix any one of them? You don't have to be perfect before you speak and act nobly. If we commend the efforts of people who are trying to make wrong things right, then those people will improve and we will all be better for it. But you and I both know, even though we encounter irritating people all the time, irritating behavior doesn't mean that reasonable conclusions are wrong, right? Even a jerk can be right. Personable character does not justify foolish conclusions, right? Nice people are sometimes wrong. Do you have to marry your neighbor's wife in order to insist that her husband doesn't beat her? Is it only emergency medical personnel who can speak out against reckless driving? I mean, just because we want to fix one injustice doesn't mean we have to engage all of them. We can identify something is wrong even without inventing anything to make it right. Recognizing evil is the first step to rectifying it. But since you brought it up, for life people, life affirming individuals actually show a great deal of compassion. Churches, charities, pregnancy centers do care for men and women and their children and their families before and during and after pregnancy. They open their hearts and share their lives with them. They long to provide them uh, with homes for their children that need adoption, fostering. In fact, if everybody was as kind and generous and devoted as pro-life people, we wouldn't need state welfare programs. And I don't want to say it out loud, but the truth is that calling somebody judgmental sounds pretty judgmental. What particular examples of unacceptable conduct do you have in mind? What facts, what claims that are made by the opponents of abortion do you dispute? And do the same standards and criticisms also apply to supporters of abortion? Did you know that Roe v. Wade perpetuated lies? Yeah, Jane Roe did not suffer a sexual assault. Jane Doe, in the companion case, Doe v. Bolton, she didn't even want an abortion. Those illegal, unsafe coat hanger abortions didn't happen very often if they happened at all. And what about abortion providers? Do they ever withhold important information about the risks of abortion or markers of fetal development or alternatives to abortion? Don't you think that people who are in favor of abortion treat unborn children judgmentally. Doesn't abortion perpetrate violence against children, against women and men and families? If a young lady were to enter an abortion facility without any money, without a place to go, without anyone to encourage or assist her, if she were to walk in that condition into an abortion clinic, not seeking an abortion, what services would she receive? It is life-affirming convictions, life-affirming practices that genuinely enable and empower a woman. And now, my friend, we have reached the end of the line. This last question that the person you're engaging with conversation in asks, is the one you want that person to ask. This person is about to throw the doors wide open and beg for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has arranged for you the opportunity. So pray, pray that every single one of your interactions and conversations about the sanctity of life gets to this point. Because this is a gigantic flashing neon highway sign 
where the Holy Spirit is pointing out to you and saying, now, now's the time you deliver the goods. And here's the question that they ask. But what if I have undergone an abortion? What if somebody that I know has had an abortion? How can you stand there and condemn us? You're no better than me. How can you say that I've done something wrong? And now is your moment to shine. The truth is, I don't have the authority to convict you of anything. I don't have the authority to acquit you of any crimes. It is the Lord God Almighty who forbids killing. You see, my friend, abortion is not just bad public policy. It is sinful. And unless it is reconciled, its guilt and its grief are going to consume your mind, heart, body, and soul. It is for this reason that the creator God, Jesus Christ, became a human being. And you need to know that he went through our weaknesses, that he experienced all of our sorrows himself, that when you suffer, you don't suffer alone. It is Jesus Christ who brought the mercy of God into our afflictions and all of our failures. He suffered crucifixion to make up for our sins, all of our sins. Jesus died to take the punishment and pay the price for abortion. And he forgives you. God forgives you and he loves you. As the, as, you're just as precious as the child that was put to death. God raised Jesus from the dead so that there will be nothing that can separate you from his salvation. God raised Jesus from the dead so that you can have relief and healing from your suffering, from your guilt, from your grief, as you trust yourself entirely to him. Now, this is the God who took the awfulness of his suffering on the cross, who took the awfulness of his dying in our place, and he made something wonderful out of it, the wonderful relationship that adopts you as his child. It is this same grace relationship, my friend, this relationship of grace with God who asks nothing of you except that you belong to him, as broken as you are, that you be his own. This grace, I guarantee you, it is going to redeem and repurpose your past, even your mistakes and your sufferings. God is going to turn those into opportunities to serve other hurting persons. God is going to turn those awful things that you went through, those awful things that you did, he will make them into testimonies that can give joy and hope and purpose to the people around you. And that is something worth saying yes to. I'm glad you guys stayed with me through the entire presentation. I'm going to try to post in the comments a document that, uh, that has kind of a write-up uh, of the points that I've been making here so that you won't have to necessarily remember all of those or write them down. I don't know if that link's going to work, but I'm going to give it a shot and uh, turn it over to our moderator, Pastor Duncan, for some questions and answers. Thank you, Pastor Solomon. Um, excellent presentation. Um, we do see the link there, and uh, hopefully everybody will be able to uh, use that. Um, there's been not a whole lot of questions that have come during the presentation, so uh, I'll give um, a little bit of opportunity for people to, to think a little bit about what you've said. Um, I, I did see that uh, Roni had uh, a, a thought, uh, if you want to share that, um, uh, with your statement about what the scripture words are, um, are sharing, Roni? Sure. Yeah, no, um, going back to the scripture, I think first or second point that you made, just looking at <clears throat> some of the linguistics in scripture, it's just very interesting to know that, at least in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for womb and the Hebrew word for compassion have the same roots. I think that there's a lot being said there. The other thing is, at least on the Greek side, maybe on the Hebrew too, but I'm not familiar with that, 
the word that denotes uh, the baby in the womb, the Greek word is the same as the Greek word for newborn. And even the Greek word for older child, when you look at the Greek of the didache, um, it shows up there as, as the same word as the baby in the womb. So I think just, just in the very linguistic structure of scripture, mm -hmm. you see a lot of, a lot of, you see the sanctity of life built into that. Yeah, the, the Lord didn't leave us really any wiggle room when it comes to communicating how much he loves every human being. That message comes through loud and clear uh, in every word, in every technical term, in all of uh, all of the stories, all of the principles and ideas. And, and any chance we have to learn more about that and point that out is just another opportunity for God's word to do its work. And, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ, ultimately, that is the power uh, to overcome the deceptions of the devil. Yeah. One more thing real quick, just medically, as you were talking, some medical thoughts came to mind mm -hmm. just from my career in pediatrics. Um, usually when a pregnancy, except for maybe the rare, very rare case of an ectopic pregnancy where the baby probably is dead anyways, yeah. usually by the time the pregnancy is going to threaten the mother, the baby is viable. And neonatologists are saving babies now, even as young as 22 weeks, which is pretty mm -hmm. amazing. So I think that's just the one point. There's never a reason to kill the baby. This abortion to term thing is 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 just it, it, it's 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 bad. It's fake news, basically. Well, Other yeah, and we need we need to be confident about that, right? We need yeah. to be uh, we need to be certain about that truth and be willing to stand on that and say we know this to be the fact of the matter. Absolutely. And the last point, just from the medical standpoint, is you know, as sinners, we tend to be curved into ourselves. And having taken care of children with chronic illness, I was a specialist in lung disease. So I saw children with asthma, cystic fibrosis. I saw a lot of children with really bad cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. very low functioning kids. What I've seen over the course of my life is parents, even those who do not identify as Christians, coming out of that incurvation towards self and really selflessly caring for and loving the other. And I've seen a lot of growth in families through that. When, and this is one of the, one of the points that's it's difficult to explain to somebody who's not experienced it. And so the kind of the best witness to give is, is to invite people into your life so they can witness it. That the life that is lived for somebody else genuinely is so much far better than the life that is lived for the self. And that is ultimately what's at the heart of um, the abortion debate and the sanctity of life is the fear that I'm going to lose myself, that I'm going to lose my rights and my privileges. And, and the truth is, when you willingly give those up for somebody else, that is the rich, abundant life. And anybody who has experienced that, like you say, whether they're Christian or not, they have tasted that blessing that God has built in to humankind. So that's why it's important for us. Um, not just to have the right words to say to people, but to invite them into our lives and our communities to see how the hope and the joy of the gospel is lived out in these relationships, and then to offer that to them. Because um, when, when I hear testimonies from people who used to be in favor of abortion access, but have changed their minds, the common thread in their experiences is always, you know what, I saw the love of people who are for life and that is what made the difference to me. Uh, so that really is the, the most powerful witness that we can give is just the relationships that we have with the people around us and even extending that compassion uh, to folks who disagree with us. Thank you, Roni. Thank you, Pastor Solomon, for those, uh, those questions and, and uh, the comments there. Does anybody else have any uh, thoughts that they would like to share with uh, Pastor Solomon uh, on the presentation? Yeah, Patty, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, Sister Patty. Patty, it sounds like you're muted. You're going to have to find that unmute button. While you're looking for that, um, Tom, uh, you had some uh, thoughts that, uh, that this was good um, provoking and life affirming. Did you want to say anything? Which one are you talking to? Me? Finally. Yeah, go ahead, Patty. You go right ahead. You 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 found it. Uh, I'm sorry. I had a rough day today, so 
Um, I just wanted to know, uh, if would anyone here like to uh, watch any of my YouTube shows that I were pro-life at all? How many well, shows do you have, Patty? How many episodes? I have almost 600 shows altogether, but I have about uh, half of that is pro-life. Well, Patty, that is outstanding, and you have been a, a champion of life issues. I would invite you, uh, if you would like to share a link to a website or a web page or a Facebook page, to put that in the chat section. And anybody who is interested would be uh, available then to, to click on that and, and save it for themselves. Okay. So please, please feel free to, uh, to share that information. And, and it is a, a wonderful testimony that you uh, have put there. Oh, thanks. Tom, did you have some uh, additional comments? Well, I appreciated the presentation and um, I did have a chance. I'm a tour bus driver as well as a visitation pastor. I had a chance to go to a farm uh, close by, a buffalo farm. They have an outreach um, called ICU uh, to help women who are uh, abortive and uh, to show them the process. And when I was there taking a group of pro-life people to that farm for a banquet, the speaker was Kay Johnson. So it was interesting to hear her, but one of her big pushes was a, pretty similar to this, that uh, we don't wanna be judgmental of those who are suffering from sin, maybe in a different form than we are, but, but still need the forgiveness that God offers. It's absolutely true. And, and um, we, we gotta remember that it's, that accusation is often brought up against Christians generally, but especially against uh, pro-life Christians that, that uh, well, don't judge. Who are you to, who are you to judge? And, and that's true. We agree with that hundred um, percent. But you got to remember that a judge pronounces two kinds of verdicts. A judge can acquit and a judge can convict. And God has not given us the authority to convict somebody of something he hasn't convicted them of. But God has also not given us the authority to acquit somebody of something he has, uh, he has not acquitted them of, right? So we can't stand in God's place and say abortion is not a big deal when God has said it is a big deal. But of course, that's the law, right? And, and we have to follow with the gospel that says, in fact, it's such a big deal that God did something serious about it. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer the punishment that we deserve, to bring us the forgiveness, which is the only thing that can set us free from that. Totally agree. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Pastor Solomon. Um, I, I had put in, as you were starting the presentation and, and went into a couple of the myths, um, that ease and convenience seem to lie at the heart of so much of abortion advocacy. And, you know, of course, we know that that is the nature of sin, uh, something that's easy for us or convenient for us, uh, causes us to turn in, as uh, Roni said, to turn in on ourselves. Um, when, when it comes to the, to the discussion uh, of ease and convenience, do you have any insight on how we, um, how we approach folks who only want to come in and, and you know, they, they want to look at the, you know, the sexual acts as just something that they can do for their, uh, their pleasure and, and they don't want to be tied down to, you know, childbearing. Um, and so we'll, we'll just look at maybe a chemical abortion because, well, well, we'll stop this before it becomes the child, et cetera. Ease and convenience. Um, I would say that the, the number of people that genuinely uh, abide by that kind of worldview that are genuinely motivated to something as awful as abortion by, um, by just the pressure of ease and convenience. That's actually very few people. I think that what genuinely motivates people toward abortion to, to sort of overcome their, um, their better judgment and their instinct that tells them this is something you should not do. I think it's panic. Like most of the time, 
people are motivated into abortion by panic. Now, they're not going to reveal that panic to everybody around them. And so um, they're going to hide it behind something like, well, it's my body. I can do whatever I want. Or uh, they'll hide behind an excuse that the culture has given them uh, that this is going to make things easier or more convenient for you. But um, I think the majority of folks are panicking. Um, and, and of course, the, the answer to fear is always the truth. Truth is the only antidote. Um, and the best truth comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's promises in Jesus Christ are what best answers that fear. Um, I think on, only the most, only in the most extreme cases does a person genuinely believe abortion is the easy way out. There are people who believe abortion is the lesser of two evils, right? But, but their motivation is panic. And I think if we approach folks with that in mind, that we, that we think we, uh, we sense that we're dealing with someone who is wounded and broken, like I am wounded and broken, that's going to soften our hearts. It's going to soften our approach. And it's going to tune us in um, to those aspects of the gospel and God's word that are genuinely going to um, get through those uh, tough exteriors that people put up and get right to the heart of things. Now, you're not always going to know when a word that you share in compassion with somebody gets through, right? Because human beings are proud. Um, we don't always let somebody know when something they've said gets through to us. And sometimes we sit with it for a few days or a few months and it rattles around in the head and it gnaws at our consciousness. And then eventually it, it makes its way through. Um, you got to trust that sometimes uh, God doesn't give you uh, the opportunity to be the one that reaps the seeds that you sow. Uh, but it does get through. It does get through. And so plant those seeds, leave them in God's hands. Um, don't be afraid to speak the truth, but in a compassionate and sensitive way and always emphasizing the gospel of Jesus Christ, that gospel of joy and hope that God's way is the best way. Thank you. I, I <clears throat> agree. Panic and fear um, are the uh, are the motivators. And, and like you said, those, those are really behind um, the the other masks mm -hmm. uh, of of sinful activity. Um, they don't want to be found out. Um, you know, Patty put down here that there's pressure of family can force abortions. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't want the the stigma of an unplanned pregnancy. Um, or and I don't know. I don't know if you guys have heard the same kind of statistics and observations that I've heard, but. Um, I've heard it several times from uh, women, especially who are post-abortive, who say, I was, I was begging for a sign from God. I was waiting for just one person to say something, to say you shouldn't do this, or to say, I'll help you through this. And it never came. And if one person had said something like that, that would have made all the difference. I mean, I hope... I hope that we can pass that kind of opportunity along to the people that we um, that we share the message with to to recognize your words can make a difference. Uh, so take those words seriously. So, so in in terms of that, um, you, you you've shared a a, um, a paper. You've shared the insights here. How would you suggest a life team or a life chapter might dissect or parse this out into smaller segments that would be useful and um, uh, able to share those words so that people will um, uh, appreciate and, and hear this message? Should, should they take like several months and, and share this in, in newsletter articles or? You know, you, you could do that. I, honestly, I think what would be most effective uh, is something that most people are uncomfortable with. And that is kind of a role play okay. where I can, uh, we can gather a group of people and we'll sit down across from one another in chairs and uh, you'll pretend to be the person that's the believer in this myth. And you'll do everything in your power to, to defend your belief in that myth and that objection. And I will practice 
um, just repeating these ideas, uh, bringing these truths to bear and, and uh, uh, sharing the appropriate angles of the gospel on this. I think that's uh, gonna work best because then we're not just dealing with words on a page or ideas, we're actually dealing with conversations and interactions with people. Um, I, I think I found that that can make a lot of difference. I, I think you're right about that, but I think there is a lot of uncomfortableness um, sure. with adult groups and uh, just try to do role play in a, in a Bible study and you'll often find that to be the case. You know what? And maybe, so maybe you need to go outside of a Bible study and uh, have a cocktail with somebody, you know, if, if you feel like that's going to help take the edge off and make it a little more comfortable situation, be in your living room together, take your shoes off, put your feet up, whatever is going to help you kind of feel more at ease with each other. That's okay. Yeah, good point. Um, uh, work through this individually and, and uh, as, as teams, um, work through uh, several people um, having the opportunity to, to, to practice the same thing and give critiques with each other. Um, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Good. Any other questions, comments that uh, others would like to add to our conversation today? Uh, I may not be able to see your hand up. So if you want to put uh, your comment in or just chime in, take yourself off mute and chime in. Uh, we have opportunity here for the next few minutes. I'm going to put one more link in the chat and that is linked to, um, kind of my, uh, abortion answers encyclopedia uh, this is a book that i frequently recommend to people it's really outstanding if you're looking for what do i say when so and so says this this is the book it's called pro-life answers to pro-choice arguments and i'll put a a link to uh to amazon Apple. there you don't have to buy it on amazon you buy it wherever you buy books but i just that's the easiest to do uh, I have that in my library. I have it digitally. I keep it on my iPad. You can keep it on your iPhone just to have it at your fingertips. But it is the definitive encyclopedia of gospel-motivated answers and, and truths to counter any question anybody could possibly ever ask or raise uh, related to these issues. So I'd recommend that to you. It's well worth the investment. I have used it many times over. I, I agree. That's Randy Alcorn's book, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, excellent resource. Anybody else have any uh, thoughts or questions that you want to talk with Pastor Solomon about um, in this issue? Please feel free to speak up. Uh, Jeff and yes. Pastor Solomon, Pastor Jeff, uh, I, I have a question. My favorite myth, which is, you know, favorite, I use that word, but is number seven about they say what we don't care about mm -hmm. kids except inside the womb. And then when once they're out of the womb, forget about it. Well, I, I always think about these kids at the border right now. Sure. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible situation. And I don't know if the government is letting pro-life people come in and help or our churches help. I don't know. Do you know, Pastor Salome? Do you know? I don't know. I do know there is just the other side of the border. Um there is a pregnancy resource center. Um, I don't remember which one it is. I'd have to go back through my notes. I did a little video on this and posted it on Facebook within the last couple of months um, cool. talking about this pregnancy resource center that reaches out specifically to refugees who are expecting um, or migrants. And that is a wonderful way to get started because they're on the ground trying to help with a particular need. Um, and I've always said to folks, look, you don't have to agree or disagree with a particular policy on immigration law to treat every person as a human being, right? right. We can still treat people as human beings without agreeing about uh, whether they should be here legally or illegally or, or what the government should be doing. We can still treat them as human beings. And so let's find some ways uh, to do that. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, Isleta Island. Mission is down there. They're a yeah. LCMS group. They do great work down there around the border. Um, but yeah, if we can get people involved uh, in that cause, I mean, the, the, the number of refugees that have been coming over the last six months is overwhelming. 
and it seems quite obvious that um, the authorities that are down there are just not equipped to deal with the situation in any kind of uh, effective or compassionate way. So if there's ways that pro-life folks can help, we would love to do that, right? Because we believe every human being is a gift from God. And so we, right. we just want to uh, participate in those blessings. So uh, great idea to raise that and to remind us that uh, the sanctity of life is threatened in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Thank you. And I think it is important for us to remember that um, in terms of, uh, of our support for all life, um, we do care for those uh, lives that are being adopted. Uh, we, we push for that. We do care for those lives that uh, are born with disabilities. And we, uh, we champion uh, areas of support for them and teach others how to care and love that life, regardless of um, the, the situation that that life is born in. We do care uh, and promote the sanctity of those lives that are um, um, uh, conceived in rape and incest. And we have heard wonderful presentations from people who um, are alive and procreating their own children following um, their own conception under difficult uh, circumstances, and yet God blesses and redeems them through the waters of baptism and gives them the promise and the hope of restoration and eternal life like anybody else. And so uh, we do provide uh, resources and support and encouragement in all of these situations. That's what Lutherans for Life is all about. And, um, and, and so, yeah, it, it, it does end that discussion. We, we are there at the end of life, supporting and encouraging those who are undergoing hospice um, um, uh, concerns with end of life. And we're teaching people how to, how to care and love that, uh, that husband, that wife, that brother, that sister, all the way to the end of their natural life on this earth uh, and, and, and provide the, the palliative care. Uh, be at their side, pray, uh, praise, and give thanks for their life, even in the midst of their suffering, um, all the way through all, to the end. Um, Pastor Duncan? Yes. Sorry, since the border came up, the other thing is I just want to remind everybody that we heard a number of months ago a presentation on human trafficking. Mm. That is, and that is a huge issue with the border mess, and and these kids, these girls get their rape, they get pregnant, and then Planned Parenthood does their abortions without asking any questions. And I bring it up, first of all, just to remind people that that presentation is somewhere on the Lutherans for Life website, but also those of us who are working on the boards of pregnancy care centers, probably want, you may want to be aware that some of these girls may show up at these places as well. And, uh, and our centers that we're, with whom we're working ought to be equipped to deal with it and to rescue these kids. Oh, I hope they come to the centers. Uh, pray, pray to God that those girls who have been through those awful situations make it to those loving pregnancy resource centers. Um, and let's just let's just keep our eyes and our ears peeled for ways that we can intervene uh, in those situations. Um, you know, let let the news media debate politics. Uh, let's let's find opportunities for the gospel one way or the other. Amen. Any final comments or thoughts from anybody? I'm delighted to share this evening uh, with you guys. Some of you uh, good friends, glad that we had a whole Fort Wayne, Indiana contingent here. Um, good to see my buddy, Debbie Lay camp uh, joining us. So many of you folks that I've met in person and, Look forward to having the opportunity of meeting uh, with you in person in the future. Uh, it's a delight for me. So thank you for giving me the gift of uh, fellowship and community this evening. And let us know when you'll be in, in uh, Fort Wayne. 100%. Okay. Very good. Well, we're going we're gonna to bring this session of For Life Live to an end. Uh, I want to remind you that on uh, July 20th, uh, Kay Meyer, the president and host of Family Shield Ministries, will present Prayer Warriors for Christ in Life. And she's going to tell you a little bit about her time at Volkerding Village, which is no longer there, but it was a, a Dakota Boys Ranch in St. Louis uh, that was a care home for unwed mothers. 
And she's going to tell you a little bit about the experience that she's had there, but also uh, challenge us to find ways to continue to lift up uh, and support life um, through our prayer and concern for others. So it's going to be right into the area that uh, Pastor Solomon can share with us tonight. Um, a, a wonderful way to lift up and encourage life at all ends of the spectrum. Thank you for being with us tonight. Look forward to uh, seeing you in two weeks. God bless. Have a good evening.